you very much and hello nerds. Uh, my name is Susan and I'm here to talk to you about walking, um, particularly the wonders of walking for people, for us, um, for places we live in and work in and, and spend time in and also for the planet. And the cute picture is my partner's niece and nephew. Um, so to give a bit of an introduction about me, walking in particular is a professional and a personal passion. Uh, my day job is a transport planner um, and I work for the firm Arup, which is a design and building engineering company working in the built environment. Um, and for most people, if I tell them I'm a transport planner, they normally think I do things like sort of Marshall lorries for Tesco or Sainsbury's or something. Um, people don't often think that the streets around them have actually been planned by somebody. Um, so I've been working as a transport planner for Arup for the last 27 years. And certainly when I started working with them, the work was more pretend you're a traffic engineer, do junction layout, do sort of, you know, designs, signal design, that type of thing. And I'm pleased to say that the, the job has changed a lot over the time. And people now realise that transport can actually be the way to shaping a healthier, happier, more vibrant world. It's, it's very much now more an influencing thing rather than just getting from, from, from A to B. Um, so... I also do love to walk and I love to talk to people about walking and try and get them enthusiastic about walking and that I think is my task for this evening. And as Louise mentioned at the beginning, um, I, I, when I got in touch about doing this talk I suggested um, that it would be good to do it in May. May is National Walking Month, um, that's something organised by the charity Living Streets which is the UK charity for everyday walking and I'm a trustee of the charity and have been for the last four years. Um, and just to say a bit about Living Streets, because it puts it in context. So Living Streets was founded in 1929, 91 years ago, as the Pedestrians Association. Um, and it often seems strange to people that pedestrians needed an, associate, needed an association. But actually, at that time, in 1929, there was something like a million vehicles on the road. Um, and if you had enough money to go and buy a car, that is all you needed to do. You could go along buy a car, take it out on the street and drive it. You didn't need a driving license. There wasn't a driving test. There weren't any restrictions. There weren't pedestrian crossings. There were no speed limits. And not surprisingly, people were dying in their thousands. So more than 6,000 people were dying on the roads because there was no protection from, from cars. So Living Streets was, was formed as a pedestrian association to actually lobby for the rights for people walking, to actually campaign for a driving test, to actually campaign for pedestrian crossings. And it's done really important work. And that, that, for, that for me is, is, is vital, that actually walking is recognised as, as a mode of transport. Um, so the charity changed its name in 2001 to Living Streets, largely because people thought the Pedestrians Association was probably not, not the right name. It didn't really reflect what their charity was about. And the banner at the bottom is really a reminder that walking takes place in many, in many shapes and forms. Um, it can be, you know, when I'm, I'm talking about walking, it's to include people with disabilities in wheelchairs, people with walking sticks, people with guide, talk, guide dogs. So it's, it's, it's as inclusive as possible. Um, so yeah, I'm a self-confessed transport planner nerd. The reason I love transport, I think, is because we are all affected by it. We all consume it. We all have opinions on it. Never tell a taxi driver what your job is if you're a transport planner because you get to hear all of their views and opinions. So yeah, I like it because it's something that everybody can relate to. Um, I said walking wasn't a key part of my, my job when I started. I don't think walking was really taken seriously as a mode of transport, but I'm glad to say over the last few years that has happened. And as Louise mentioned at the beginning, never before has it been so high profile. Um, but unfortunately for many people, if you say walking, this, this is what springs to mind. This is a, a Monty Python sketch from the, the Ministry of Silly Walks, which is actually now 50 years old. But you still find, even, even recently, there was something on Twitter that someone actually said that if they were going, people were going to be walking past their property, there had to be the Ministry of City Walks. And there were some great shots of people doing crazy walks. Um, but that, that is sort of, that conjures it up for me, is that that is still the association people make for walking. Um, they, do, they don't take it seriously. And as it is, and the word pedestrian has negative connotations. If you look pedestrian up in the dictionary, it's sort of, it's dull or it's mundane. Um, so what I want to do is to try and show you that walking is very far from dull or mundane. And I guess my, my hope for you is that after this, you will be enthusiastic about walking and will emerge as walking warriors onto the street. 
and this is the sort of point where I, have we been with an audience, I would have said, how many people walked here this evening or got some audience participation? So a bit trickier to do online, but hopefully you will at least have walked to where you are sitting to be, to be watching this. Um, so as this is for nerds, I thought I would start off with some facts, which is how, how much walking do we do? Um, and this is information from the Department for Transport. They conduct something called the National Travel Survey, which they've actually been doing since the mid 1960s. Um, and as nerds like facts and how facts are gathered, it's a, a diary um, which is for seven days and also a household survey, and it has more than 14,000 respondents. And people talk to people about how they travel, and that's how the department gets this information. This is how it bases its planning. Um, because it's self reported, that in itself can be a problem because people don't always remember the journeys that they've made or don't always record them accurately. But summary data on average, averages are always dangerous, of course, people walk 210 miles per person per year, which is just over half a mile a day. They spend 16 minutes walking. Um, but in terms of all trips, it's just over a quarter of trips or 3% 3 3 of the distance they travel. So maybe 200 miles a year doesn't sound too bad. But actually, if you look at the chart underneath, and this is the frequency of walks of 20 minutes or more, the green bar, yep, 69% walk for more than 20 minutes at least once a week. Again, that might not sound too bad. The concerning bit for me is, is the orange bar at the other end, which is 18% of people say they walk for 20 minutes or more less than once a year or never. Now, I've never quite grasped the subtlety of what is the difference between less than once a year or never, but this is the way the DFT reports it. So you have typically you have one in five people who never walk for more than 20 minutes at a time. Um, so what's the difference in London? London people do walk more than, than in England or the national average, which is the DFT stats. So these are figures from 2018. Um, TFL, if you like transport stats, does a great report called Travel in London, does it every year. It's on Travel in London 12 at the moment. And this shows that in London, there are 27 million trips a day. Obviously, pre-COVID, it's changed a lot since then. And about a quarter of them, 6.7 million of those trips are for walking trips. But it's always quite hard to actually measure walking. Cars, you can measure by putting a strip down across the highway and you know how many wheels go across it. Buses, you can measure through Oyster cards, how many people pay when they go on, similarly for tube and similarly for train. Cycling, they're starting to put up some cycle counters on some of the cycle lanes. But walking is actually really hard to measure know how many people are walking along a street at one time so it often does get under underrepresented. Um, walking and I said I've made this more London focused because it was Nerd Night London but I see from the chat I think there are people joining from Canada and elsewhere so forgive, forgive the London centric focus to this but I said when I started planning it I was thinking more Nerd Night London so if you can bear with me on that one. Um, so walking in London, this was actually London's first ever walking action plan. It came out in July 2018. Um, before that, there wasn't an action plan for walking. The sort of the view was you just put one foot in front of the other. Why, why, why do you need a walking action plan? Um, and this gives the stats for London. So in 2017-18, the average daily walk distance per person was 1.2 kilometres. So about three quarters of a mile. So we do walk more than people in, in England nationally. And 0.7 is you walk all the way trips and 0.5 of a kilometre is walk stages to another mode. So in other words, walking to the bus stop, walking to the train station. So about half the walking people do in London is in conjunction with public transport. But the stats I would really like you to focus on, because generally these are the ones that people find quite surprising. This is for car trips in London. And one in seven car trips in London is shorter than a kilometre. And you've got one in three car trips. So a third of all car trips in London are shorter than two kilometres. And it, this is a similar picture in other cities. In some cases, it's actually more extreme because London does have a good public transport network. But what this means is you have a lot of really, really short trips. So if I talk to people about walking, they'll say, oh, yeah, but I can't walk 30 miles to get to work. So it doesn't doesn't you know it's not important but you can walk to the station but actually the really big thing for me is the number of very very short car trips that could be replaced by walking trips or could be replaced by cycling trips so it makes a lot of sense to actually get rid of some of those car trips but actually it makes a lot of sense for individuals and for places and for the planet which is what i'll come on to now so in terms of benefits for people for all of us i want to talk about the benefits in terms of health 
the benefits in terms of wealth and, because it's nerd night, the benefits in terms of brain power. So if we look first at the, the health stats, um, this is from Public Health England, and this is for physically active people. Now, what Public Health England have shown is that, yes, there's a range of ways in which you can be physically active, but actually going to the gym once a week, playing football once a week, is not the way to be active. What Public Health England want to focus on is two 10 minute bursts of activity a day, 20 minutes a day. That's not massive, but that gets you to your 150 minutes, bar 10 minutes per week, which is what they're recommending. Um, so that is the focus of their activity, is, is, is 10 minutes of brisk activity twice a day. And just actually on that one, because a lot of people talk about it, is the 10,000 steps. There's this sort of mythical, if we do 10,000 steps a day, we're all fine. But this actually has no real basis. It seems to come from 1965 when a Japanese company developed a pedometer, which was called Mampo K, which literally means 10,000 steps meter. And all of a sudden, this sort of 10,000 steps, everyone started quoting it. And it's a bit like something on Twitter now. Someone quotes it and someone else quotes it. And before you know it, it's a fact. Um, but actually, 10,000 steps walked very slowly will not give you health benefits and will be quite boring. So if you get your 20 minutes a day, this is the sort of benefits it can give you. It can be a 40% reduction in cognitive decline, 30% um, reduction in all-cause all mortality, 48% reduction in depression. Um, there are many medical doctors out there who say it's the equivalent of a wonder drug. You know, and doctors are now actually starting to prescribe walking as activity. It can be cycling as well, but it can be a harder ask to get someone to start cycling for the first time. Whereas we all walk, it's just that walk a little bit further. Um, so massive benefits to being physically active, to walking. But actually, figures from last year, 2018-19, only 31% of Londoners, so a third of Lon less than a third of Londoners, achieved two lots of 10-minute um, sessions of active travel per day or activity per day. So e even in London, which is generally a fitter population, people are not getting that, that, that exercise, that, that brisk walking. So walking is good for our bodies. Walking is also free. So this is, this is, this is you know, great, should be great news for everybody. So the, the chart here is from the Office of National Statistics and it shows national household expenditure um, which is £585 a week. It excludes mortgage and rent payments. But these are the key things that people spend their money on. And transport is actually the biggest item of expenditure. Nearly 14% of the household budget goes on transport, more than goes on food. And I just find it astonishing and slightly worrying that we spend more on transport than we do on food. So walking is free and it is completely reliable. You know what time you're going to arrive somewhere because it's up to you. You don't have to worry about the bus not being cancelled or anything. So it's a great way of getting around. And then the brain power one. Um, there, there was various bits of research, but there was a study done by Stanford University um, four years ago, so six years ago now, that found that walking improved creativity. So creativity increased by an average of 60% when walking. And actually, that doesn't have to be outside. That's not to do with the um, stimulus of the built of the natural environment. That also applies if you walk on a treadmill. And they did case studies, actually, or control studies, having people sitting, but also having people sitting in a wheelchair being pushed around to see whether there was any stimulus in the environment. So actually, walking does, does improve your creativity. Um, the, the Nietzsche quote, all truly great thoughts are conceived by walking. And then one of the ways, again, walking is tested is by doing the Stroop test, where you show people the, the, the list of words and the colours, and you ask people to name the font colour of the word um, and see how people's reactions are. So again, that's another way that the, the creativity is, is testing. So the good thing is walking actually helps your brain. Then it brings around benefits for the places in which we, love, in which we live, the home, work, and the high street. So in terms of, of being at home, if, if you walk around places, you know your neighbours, your neighbourhood tends to be safer because you are the eyes on the street knowing what's going on and you see changes. You can look out for each other, you can help reduce loneliness. So the big, the big picture here is from um, the Mayor's Transport Strategy. It shows what is in, intended by a healthy street, people out on the street, people talking to each other, people sitting down. Um, and the top left photograph is actually my own neighbours. I'm pleased to say I know all my neighbours. They're all wonderful. We get on together. And it's actually a real source having having people around um, for great benefits from that. And we're always out walking and talking to each other. In terms of the workplace, whether you are an employer or an employee, it can bring benefits. So people who walk to work report greater job satisfaction. 
but also people who are physically active take fewer sick days. So there's big benefits for an employer because obviously that's a, a big cost saving. And then in terms of the, the high street, people who walk to town centres spend more money than people who drive there. The perceived wisdom has been for years, it's the car driver that has all the money, but TfL data show that people who walk spend 40% more in town centres over the course of a month than car drivers. And similarly, research done by Living Streets, the pedestrian pound, it's people who walk who spend more money. So it places, the important thing is having walking to them, not car drivers. And then the last group to look at really is benefits to the, to the planet that come from walking. Um, the graph shows, this is from um, the decarbonising transport, which came out a couple of months ago. And you can see ringed in red there, transport is the largest emitting sector. And also it's the one that's pretty much straight lining. Other sectors like energy are going down. Transport is, is, is remaining as, as, as in terms of its carbon emissions. And my belief, my, my view is that walking is the only true carbon zero mode. Cycling's not far behind it. Um, one of the things that, that always bugs me is when people talk about zero emission vehicles for electric vehicles, they're, they're not zero emission. They might be zero emission at the tailpipe, but they're not if you look at the, the whole life carbon of the vehicle and they still contribute to congestion and emit particulates and things. So walking is, is the true zero carbon mode. Then in terms of the environment, walking doesn't rely on non-durable resources. It optimizes land use. Um, the indicator on the left is for what Transport for London consider as healthy indicators of a street. So walking helps a street not be too noisy. More people walking on the street makes it feel safe. Walking doesn't have any adverse um, impacts in terms of clean air. So walking helps to contribute to a healthy street. And I think the flip side of that is the, is the picture on the right, which is on, on my own street in Islington. And that's the increasing number of, of larger vehicles on the streets, which have the opposite effect. So one in three vehicles bought in the UK now is an SUV. Um, they're more polluting, they take up more space. If they hit somebody walking, they will more likely to kill that person because they're much higher vehicles and they will hit you at your vital organs. Um, so they are, they are the complete opposite as far as I'm concerned. They're the transport gluttony side of the coin rather than walking. Um, and then lastly, in terms of looking at the benefits really is the equality angle. For me, walking is the most um, equitable mode. It's the fairest, most democratic mode. You don't have first class footways, second class footways. It's a real great mixer and leveller. Um, and I chose this photograph. It's, it's Newington Green, where I live. And the building in the back is the um, Unitarian Church, which is often regarded as the birthplace of feminism. So I thought for a, a picture of equality, that, that one was a nice one to show. Obviously, all these images are pre-COVID, so people aren't social distancing. Um, so that's a bit of a look at the, the benefits of walking. And I want to close really with some of the um, information that's in the, the press at the moment. So I think during lockdown, people have become to uh, people have come to value in particular walking in a way they never have done before. For many people, they, people don't see walking the way that I do. People walking was seen as a bit of a chore. But for many people now, it's become the absolute highlight of their day. And because of the improved air quality and the reduced noise, I think and the beautiful blue skies and the sunshine, people have been noticing flowers more, they've been noticing birdsong, their, their life has, has changed and walking has become a real highlight. And with the slight easing of lockdown we have now, and people, but people in, being encouraged not to use public transport and it's absolutely essential, people are being urged to walk and cycle in a way they never have done before. So the, um, the government came out with encouraging cycling and walking on the 9th of May, a two billion package, um, London is following with its streetscape campaign, which is about widening footways because you can't social distance on, the, on a, a typical footway is 1.8 metres wide. So you cannot social distance for two metres on a normal footway, um, putting in cycle lanes, taking out some parking, particularly where you have people queuing outside of shops because otherwise you can't park. So it's great that walking is out there. Actually, you know, people are talking about it more. My slight frustration is that nearly all the press coverage about this is about cycling. Walking doesn't doesn't get the, the coverage it, I think it, it deserves. Um, so I hope that's been interesting. What I hope is you all value walking more, thinking about it a bit more, and you might just become a walking. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Um, that was brilliant. And um, yeah, I am. Um... I'm both a cyclist and a pedestrian and occasionally a, a terrible driver. But, um, but I have to say in, in the uh, 
ongoing identity battles between between those identities i i do like my little strolls and i have found like all of the 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 benefits it's so 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 very cliched but a day which i don't leave the house or a couple of days if i haven't left the house i really notice it on my mood and i just need to like like a couple of streets a few flowers and it all gets a little bit better um susie have we had some questions through the chat for um for susan yes we've had loads and loads of questions so i don't think we're going to get through them all but um i will try to ask as many as we can um, so does the number of people who don't walk that we saw at the beginning in those charts account for people with different abilities so maybe people who can't walk that far i think in, in some parts it does inevitably and you can look at the breakdown by age but i think a lot of it is the really short car journeys as i mentioned you know people take people driving a car for you know 500 meters or something so a lot of it comes about from that because i think 75% of households do have a car and the tendency is if you have a car, you're going to use it um, because it's it's just, it's sitting there, you've got your car keys in your pocket, you've paid a lot of money for it and so you're going to use it for every trip. So some of it will do to ability. Some some kit trips can't be walked, I fully accept that. If you're carrying a lot of stuff or you're traveling at certain times of the day or night, it won't always work. But certainly there's a high number of really short car trips or some of those short public transport trips that could be made by walking instead. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so there's another question. So as we come out of lockdown, walking in London is likely to increase. It's a golden opportunity to make it stick. What's the single most important and achievable thing that highway authorities and local councils need to do to make that happen? Um, London is slightly different because the way it's organised at the moment. So I mean, London does have things like the congestion charge and the ultra low emission zone. So outside of London, I would say some form of road charging. Um, coupled with 20 mile an hour speed limits in urban areas. Um, so a, a lot of it, unfortunately, is about, I think it's about deterring those short car journeys. You can make the walking environment as, as nice as it could possibly be, and you will still have a large cohort of people who won't walk. And if I talk to people about why they don't walk, it's often it's the weather, you know, it's too cold, it's too hot, it rains too much. Actually, our climate is fine for walking. You know, I walk to work every day when we're not in shut lockdown and I hardly ever get wet, you know, and if it rains, I put up an umbrella. So I think for me, it is largely down to actually restraining car use, removing parking as well. You know, if people can't easily park, they won't drive. Well, thank you. Um, should we reconsider pavement construction or materials to make walking easier? Ooh. Um, I suppose it depends what it's like in the first place. I mean, things like cobbles, yes, certainly are very difficult to walk down. If you've got a good tarmac pavement, it's probably fine to walk down. I think the bigger thing is all the obstacles on the footway. You know, the amount of times I walk down the street and if there's a traffic sign or the, the lamp column or something, it often tends to be put right in the middle of the footway. You know, why not put it at the back or the front? Um, it also pavements also get cluttered by sometimes by bikes being left there particularly some of the higher bikes by rubbish being left there it's almost I find I, I joke with my partner that every every trip is a site visit and he's used to me sort of growling and taking photographs of things it's almost every street you walk down you could see a way of making it nicer for the walking environment but if it was a bit wider putting in some planting putting in some benches it's all about making the street a nicer environment to be more comfortable to be in all ways cool Thank you very much. Um, so this is one I was particularly interested in because I run and walk quite a bit. How much of the health benefits of walking are negated by the inhalation of pollution? There's, there's been studies done of that. And actually, I think you would have to work walk pretty much 24 hours for the health impacts from pollution to be worse than the um, health, for that to outweigh the health benefits you'd get from walking. And actually, what studies have shown is that air quality in cars is worse than air quality on streets. So it's actually drivers and car passengers who suffer the worst from poor air quality because it gets recycled and put into the vehicle. Um, but most people don't don't perceive it in that way. But yeah, the, the worst air quality is in a vehicle. OK, cool. Well, not cool. Very bad. Um, is there a big difference between walking and jogging in terms of health benefits? Um, 
guess it depends on the speed at which you jog and the speed at which you walk. Um, I'm quite a brisk walker, which is I put up this quote at the end because I like it. So there, there can be different benefits. I mean, certainly jogging can be higher intensity in terms of, you know, raising your heart and things, but it can have other sides in terms of damaging your knees. So I think it depends very much on the individual and, and the speed they go. But the main thing is, is that, you know, if it is walking, it is it is brisk walking. That's where the main benefits, whereas strolling, pleasant as it is, will not give you the same benefits. Great. Um, so another question here. There is an ableism inherent in so many conversations that are happening at the moment about walking and cycling. What's being done to get more people with different abilities into these conversations by local authorities or planners? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that one. And I think there needs to be more consultation at the start of schemes, more market research to find out different people's needs. Um, so for, for a long time, we have the legacy of a built environment that's been planned by the very narrow demographic that sort of op that operates it. So there's some great, a great book that was came out last year called Invisible Women that really looks at how most of our built environment has been I said, designed by a very na narrow demographic of, of, of reference man. Um, and I think, you know, it's talking to colleagues, male colleagues, when they suddenly start pushing a buggy around the streets, they experience the streets in a very different way. Similarly, if you injure your leg and you're on crutches and you try and cross the road, you realise, again, you see it in a very different way. And I think the whole planning process needs to be more inclusive of both um, age, physical disability or physical health, and also for mental health as well. So again, people with mental health conditions can see the built environment in a, in a very different way and experience it in a very different way. And it's about being more inclusive right from the start, but also we very rarely start by planning whole new streets. You know, the, mostly what the streets we've got are already there. And I think it's about doing sort of audits of the streets we have at the moment to see how they can be made inclusive to make them better for, for everybody. Okay, great. Um, so I think this will be the final question, unless um, unless we've got loads more time, but I think this is about right. Um, so this is um, asking you how you've coped with lockdown. Have you found any alternatives to walking? Um, so this questioner she says that she loves hiking and walking and she's getting a bit desperate in these lockdown days. Um, good, interesting question. I mean, for me, my, my, my main activity was always my walk to work and some of my walk home. My water work now is from the bed to my kitchen table. So, you know, that that's that's not such a great walk. But for me, it's being absolute that I get out at lunchtime. I always used to end up doing a lot of lunchtime meetings and different things. Whereas now, you know, I, I will make sure that between half 12 and half one, I get out for a good walk. I try and vary route. And it's just sometimes it can just be looking at different things. So um, even on my walk to work, one of the talks um, talking about the last seven years, I went to a great one on coal holes. I'd never really noticed coal holes before, but if you start looking for these things on your walking route, you start to look at different things. And I was talking to a colleague earlier today and she was like, she was getting bored walking the same street. So she would look for things of a different color each day, you know, look to see whatever she could find that was red, you know, and it's just, it's just, I think looking in more detail each time to, to see different things, to appreciate different flowers coming into bloom, to see the changes. Um, but for me, yeah, getting out, lunchtime ideally end of the day now we're allowed to get out more than once that's that's what keeps keeps my sanity and i think i think that's true for a lot of people that i've talked to as well so i would always encourage a walk when it when in doubt walk is my mantra yeah it's a good one um okay i think that's everything from the whatsapp guys and um, thank you very much i really enjoyed that Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was absolutely great. And good questions, team. I know that I can always uh, rely on you. Um, the the hints about kind of ways to make an urban walk more interesting. Um, there's an article I read a while ago, um, which was about, especially if you live in quite an urban environment with like lots of advertising around and sort of lots of branded things around, is um, to try and focus on the things that aren't calling for your attention. So just sort of try and look at the shadows and the sort of the quiet bits of the street and you end up looking at the world really really differently 